if there wasn't COVID, people would be traveling for crusades. And so, I myself, I was going to the Philippines before this uh, thing. You know, I had an event there, you know, you know, April last year, which I had to cancel. Everything was already planned, you know, and all that. We can do all of that. We can plan all those things and do all those great things. But stay in his presence for one hour. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46 and verse 10. To be still in his presence for one hour, flesh cannot do it. And you have to practice it. I myself have to practice it. Can you say amen? amen. <laughs> you have to practice. You know, when you get into that place, folks, that's the place where you are not coming with prayer points. There is no prayer point. Because I am that exceeding great reward. Yeah. Not that God will do this. Do this for me. Father, do this. Father, do this. Do this. In that place, we're not doing that. We're just focusing on him. You're just relishing and enjoying his presence. Now, even as I'm preaching this, your flesh doesn't like this message. <laughs> because this is not the kind of message for the flesh. You know, I can preach excitable messages like come out here and talk about great faith and great power and great prosperity and so forth. Flesh might like that one. But stay in his presence. Be still and know that I am God. Walk with God. You know, walk on that flesh, kill that flesh, and get back into the nature of Christ. And flesh doesn't like that one. Flesh doesn't like it. You know, if you want to know what God looks like, look at Christ. He was the express image of his person. Look at Christ. What would Christ do? You know, a lot of people say that. What would Christ do? And so on. Now, so in order for us to move to get into that holy, most holy place, there is a transition. Now, in the outer court of the 30%, you can still make heaven. People can make heaven in the outer court. 60%, they can make heaven as well. But the measure of Christ that you have on earth is limited. It's not that you're not going to go to heaven. But the measure of Christ that we have in the outer court. See, the light is too dim in the outer court. It's too far from the most. See, the most holy place is where that bright light is. That eternal Shekinah glory. But by the time you get to the outer court, the light is too dim. You got to get closer, folks. Amen. Yeah. We have to get closer. Let me tell you another thing about that light. This is something you may not have thought about. But I've mentioned it before and I've spoken about it one time. There is a spectrum of life. On one side, there is death and darkness. On the other side, there is light and life. Now, the moment Adam did what God told him not to do, what he had before was just life and light. When he did what God told him not to do, death and darkness begin to creep in. Now remember, God did not eradicate darkness. After he created the light, he said, let the light be called day and let the darkness be called night. He left the darkness in place and even gave it a name. But he didn't say, let there be darkness no more. If he had said that, there would not be any darkness. Death comes because of darkness. See, darkness... Is what gives time. The evening and the morning were the first day. So that's the measure of time. Because light is there, and after a while darkness comes, then you measure time. See, when that goes away, in the new heavens, the Bible says there shall be no night there. Amen. There will be no night. There's no measure of time anymore. That's why you can live forever. Because there is no measure of time. But let me bring it back to what I want. I just wanted to explain that. But this light, when you get into that perfect place of brighter communion and perfect union with God in that most holy place, Deuteronomy 12 verse 5 says, the place that I have chosen to put my name there, that's where I will meet with you. 
There is a place where he will meet with us. Put up that scripture, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 5. The place that I will meet with you is that place that I have chosen to put my name there. That's where he will meet with you. Now, when you begin to walk towards God, when you begin to walk towards God, here is what happens. This is what happened to Enoch. Enoch also had a measure of the likeness of Adam. He also had a measure of darkness and death. But he had a measure of light and life. And the rate at which light, see, now remember, in the book of first, in the book of John chapter 1, it says Jesus is the light that lightens every man that comes into this world. The, the light that is in you, that light must continue to grow. And if it can grow faster than the rate at which death and darkness is growing, uh, everybody has a little bit of that death and darkness. You know, except God. John, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the first epistle, not the gospel. First epistle, John 1, 5 says, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, but we still have to deal with that darkness, and darkness is what brings death. When you begin to get, if, if you can, if the rate and the measure of Christ in you, which is the light, if it can increase exponentially faster than the rate of life and death, you go into that light. It's just that simple. Now, this may be a little too profound, but it, it, I can't say it any other way. That's just the way it is. And when you get into that place, one of two things will happen. You will either be translated like Enoch, or you continue to live forever. It's one of two things. You, death cannot get somebody who is in that realm. Can't do it. Let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus said, as long as I am in this world, I am the light of the world. Amen. Amen. How many of you know that? And he even tried to transfer the light to his disciples. He said, look, you also are the light of the world. You know, be like me and so on. You know, well, sometimes they tried. Sometimes they didn't. You know, the, 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 the consciousness of sin did not make them fully appreciate what Christ was doing. But I tell you about Christ. Christ never went in and out of that light. He never went in and out of that glory. He was always there. In that realm, he could not die. Death could not get him. It was impossible. Just like Enoch. See? But it was in the predetermined counsel of God that Christ had to die. Hello? So put up Matthew chapter 27. Let's start from verse 45. You have to go with me quickly in the back there. Now, from the sixth hour, this was when Christ was about to be crucified. Here's something unique that happened. From the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Now, Jesus said, I am the light of this world. Now, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He groaned in his spirit. Why has thou forsaken me, O God? Did you know that God forsook him? Did you know that? The light had to depart from him. Because God put upon him all the sins of this world. And for a moment, that light departed from him. That's why there was darkness three hours. Darkness all over the place. And people say, wow. This had to be the son of God. Darkness. In that moment, the light separated from him, and death got him. Now, death could not have got him until that light departed from him. And Jesus said, why has thou forsaken me? When Jesus was crying in the garden, lamenting, and blood was coming out of his forehead when he was praying, you think he was afraid of physical death? No. He was afraid of becoming darkness. Because God had to make him darkness for a minute because of you. When he put all the sins of the world, he said, Christ who knew no sin, he became sin for us. In that moment, darkness was upon him. God had to depart. That's right. 
God already knew all of that. So you can't kill God. So that's why God, in the beginning, he already knew he had to bring his son in his image who would die. God will be separated from him for a minute, but then he'll be reunited with the Father. Hallelujah. It was a great thing that Christ did for us. Now, chew on that for a minute. And chew on that when you get out of here as well. When you are in that place of that brighter communion, that full image and likeness with Christ, it's not a confession, folks. It's not confessing that, oh, I'm going to rapture, I'm not going to die. It's, it's a reality in that realm. It's not a confession. You can be confessing, confessing. It's not a confession. We grow into that reality. The Bible says grow into him. The, throughout the gospel, I mean, throughout the epistles, they were praying, like Colossians chapter 1. They were praying that you may be filled with the knowledge of God, that you may be filled and, have, you know, walk with, walk with God unto all pleasing and so on. All of these things were in God. Let me tell you something else about growing in his stature into the image of Christ. So this is something that everybody can understand. Maybe the other one was too deep. But let's talk about something everybody can understand. Everybody understands how a little child, when they are born, right? Little child. Every one of us was a little child at one time. And many of us have raised children. A little child, when they start growing up, when they are from the time they are born, sometimes they get into, you know, the toddler stage and all that. All that time, they have to deal with diapers, wetting their bed, and all of these things. But there is a measure of stature that they grow into that that thing just doesn't happen anymore. You know, when they are little, your parents will actually tell them, well, when they are trying to teach them, you know, how not to wet their beds, <laughs> maybe the parents will make them not drink water towards, this, you know, evening time and so on. But there's a point that they get to in their life, they can drink 10 gallons of water, they are still not going to wet their bed because they have grown out of it. The stature has grown. There is a measure of the stature of Christ that we must grow into. In the book of Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about it. It's called the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, right now, some of us are operating at 30%. Majority of us are operating at 60%. It's going to take us some time to get to that 100%. But don't give up. Amen. <laughs> We must keep walking towards that 100%. There is a measure of the stature of Christ in which certain elements of the flesh are not even there. It's not that you are thinking about it. It's not there anymore. Praise God. It's like the baby who has grown out of it. And you begin to grow in Christ. As your stature begins to grow. See, those chains of sin begin to snap off and break off. That's why he says, you know, in Isaiah chapter 52, and he says, you know, he says, look, verse 2. Lose thyself from the bands around thy neck. Hallelujah. When you grow in stature, I said this last time, I said, look, you grow in stature. You know, the young kids who watch the uh, Incredible Hawk and so forth. You grow in stature, those garments begin to break off. You just grow. You grow in stature of Christ, the garment of sin begins to snap off. Begin to snap off. But it takes a lot of work. The work happens in the holy place. We're in the holy place right now. We're doing that work. We must kill that flesh. And the next time you are in prayer and trying to be still in his presence and your flesh tells you, you got to get up and go and drink coffee or take a look at your what's up, tell the flesh to die. Hallelujah. Be still and know that I am God. You cannot know until you are still. When you are running around, <laughs> like Martha was running around and everything, <laughs> Mary wanted to be still. And you know, one time Jesus said to Martha, Martha, you are so encumbered with so many things. Because she came to Jesus and said, look, Lord, why am I running around preparing the food and everything and so on? And Martha is just sitting at your your foot here. Tell my sister to help me. <laughs> and Jesus said, Martha, Martha, 
you are so encumbered with all this running around. But Mary has chosen that which is needful. Sit right there. Be still in his presence. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, it's something we got to practice. I'm practicing it myself. But I tell you what. It's something that we have to get back to. In order to have that full dominion, and we're coming into that in perhaps the next time, on the next continuation of this, we're coming into what that full dominion looks like. And we're coming into what the manifestation of the sons of God look like. But this is a precursor to help us understand this thing. God cannot give you dominion, folks, when you are not in his image and after his likeness. Dominion is more than authority. Dominion is you are in charge. Do as you like. Hallelujah. <laughs> authority is, look, Jesus gave them authority against unclean spirits. And he gave them authority a little bit here, a little bit there. Dominion is not like that. Dominion is you are in charge. You do whatever you want. Whatever you say goes. Well, the flesh cannot handle that. If God puts some of us in dominion, we'll be doing crazy things. Kill your enemies. Do all of these things is what you'll be doing. If God puts you in dominion, the first thing you're going to remember is that enemy that did you this on your job. Kill that one. Kill the other one. Kill this one. Kill that one. No. <laughs> Praise God. So we have to kill this flesh. You have to pummel it. This is one of the things we do during consecration, folks. You say, what is consecration? Let me tell you what consecration is. Consecration is your name is Elijah, and you have to wear camel's skin inside out. The rough skin on your back all your life. Consecration is you are a prophet and you have to lie on your side 390 days. Consecration is you have to walk naked as a prophet and so forth. Isaiah, Jeremiah, all these people did these things. That's consecration. Consecration means I embrace, I mean, I, I must obey Christ till the point that I embrace the sufferings that come as a result of that obedience. Amen. Amen? That's consecration. Now, if John the Baptist appeared here today, wearing camel skin like Elijah, many of us will be casting the devil out of him because he's dressed rough and he looks ugly. Cast the devil out of him. Or don't even let, let him into our consecration, I mean, into our service. <laughs> Praise God. But... Who tells you that God can't choose to do that? Consecration, a place of consecration is you embrace Christ fully. We're not looking for sufferings, but we embrace whatever sufferings comes out of it. We're looking for obedience. Amen. Christ was fully obedient to the spirit. That's why he got that commendation before he even did any miracles. We must get to that point. Amen. Amen, folks. I'm going to round up here, and I'm going to tell us one or two more things. Now, you say, but who then can achieve this? This is too, too I mean, it's just too hard. Well, it starts by practicing. You practice his presence. Amen. You practice doing things like him. You know, we're all in the holy place now. We've got the Holy Spirit. He can help us. You know, we practice. We practice. We practice. And then when he tells you something, you do it. Obedience. When your obedience is fulfilled, see, then he begins to move you further. If you get into that place where Christ was, that's the place where you are not praying for God to take away the storm. In that place, you are sleeping through the storm. Hallelujah. Difference between Jesus and the disciples. Jesus was in that place. And he said, let us go to the other side. And let us go to the other side. The word that he spoke will sustain itself. Doesn't matter whether there is storm. Doesn't matter whether the boat is about to crash. He already said, let us go to the other side. And in, in him, he has peace. Hallelujah. He's in a place of union with the father. He said in John 10, verse 30, I and my father are one. 
And that's why they took up stones to kill him. Jesus said again in John chapter 8 and verse 42. I came forth and proceeded out of God. Now, why do I bring these two verses as we're about to close? Well, since Christ is the one that we have to look at, we need to figure out a way that we also can be in union with the Father. To be in union with the Father, you need to be in union with Christ. Came forth and proceeded. I came not out of myself. He came out of God. See? And we believe that we must return to that place. That's how you do it. In that place of brighter intimacy with, with God, you are not praying that he would solve your problems. You are only what you want there is God himself. Amen. Praise God. When you are in that place with him, there is nothing that is important. Not even what God himself can offer you. Even what God can offer. Your next new car. Your next new house. All good and perfect gifts come from God. God can offer you all those things. But all those things, when you are in his presence, they pale. You don't even think about that. You don't think about that anymore. It's not about give me my next rent, give me my next car, give me my next house and so forth. It's about, I want more of you, Lord. I want God. I want God. God wants us to be united with him. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet. Now, this is a consecration message. And it's timely because this was our consecration weekend. For us to get back into that place of consecration. If you're out there and you haven't given your life to Christ, well, you have to start the journey. It's a long journey, folks. It took Enoch 300 years. It's a long journey. And, but you have to start somewhere. Amen. You start, but don't stop. Some people even said a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Well, take the step to come into Christ. By faith, through salvation, you come in and you are entered into that outer court. But you can choose to stay there and not proceed. You can stay there and not proceed. It's like Ezekiel's vision with the water. The water can be at your ankles or to the knees or to the, to the belt or water that cannot be you know, crossed over and so on. So which one? Are you going to stay there? No, but move. The Bible says we must grow in Christ. We must grow in Christ. Praise God. We must grow in Christ. So as we are going to pray, I'm going to read this prayer point that we are going to pray about. Now, this is the new creation prayer point. This is not the old creation prayer point of, you know, Lord, give me this and give me the other thing and so forth. This is a new creation uh, prayer. So let's read it. Let's go to Colossians uh, chapter 1. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. For this cause, verse 9, Paul said, Since the day we heard of your faith, we do not cease to pray for, for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Remember, Ephesians chapter 4. You can read it, you know, from verses 11 to 13. The height of that thing is the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We must keep increasing. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power. And all patience and long suffering and so forth with joyfulness. Praise God. Let's lift up our hands and let's pray. And when we talk about the manifestation of the sons of God, you don't want to miss it. It might change your perspective on a lot of things. But let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, pray with me. Lord, I pray. Give me understanding of the purpose of God in my life. Why I'm here. Help me to grow into that image. And into that likeness of Christ. 
Because that's how God created and what he intended for us. But we fell because of disobedience. Through one man's disobedience, the Bible says, death passed unto all. But through one man's obedience, which is Christ, righteousness and life comes back to all of us. And Father, Lord, help us to grab a hold of that life and that light. The Bible says, walk in the light. If you walk after me, Jesus said, you will be in the light. You will not walk in darkness. You will be in the light. We have to walk in the light. All these other things, God, we add unto you. But you must seek him first. Seek God first. I want God must be our prayer. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us practice right now. I want everybody to be still. No music. Nothing. No singing. Just practice. Be still. And know that I am God. Did you know that if I hold you in this state for 10 minutes, people will start looking at their watch? Be still and know that I am God. You can whisper words of adoration in your mind to him, but that's all. Don't think about anything else. And the aspect of him that he reveals, the aspect of himself that he reveals to you when you are in that quiet place. And you begin to worship that aspect of him. You become that aspect. Whereby I given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. That we might become in the image and in the likeness of God. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. And as we await the coming of the Lord, we are saved already, even if in, we're in the outer court. We are saved and filled with the Spirit, even in the holy place with the 60%. But why settle for 30 or 60 when you can have 104? The measure of Christ that is in you could be 30% in the outer court, could be 60% in the holy place where God is preparing you for an experience. Or you could transform into that most holy place. That's what this series is all about, transformation. Father, we thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. Let's put our hands together for the Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord.
want us to keep reminding ourselves that we are on a journey. It's not a journey necessarily of one day or two days. It's a lifetime journey and we must keep, we are on the track and we must stay on the track. Amen. Praise the Lord. We have to stay on the track. So I'm going to read this and I'd like us to sing this chorus. Just to remind us, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 says, But we all with open face, we are beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord and we are changing to the same image from glory to glory. So it's a process, folks, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So there's a song that we sing like that. From glory to glory, he's changing me into the glory of God and the likeness of God and his son. He's changing. He's changing me. Let's sing that song. Somebody raise that song for me. From glory to glory, he's changing me. Changing, changing me. Changing, changing me. Sing it for yourself. To the glory of God and His Son, He's changing, changing me. He's changing me. Changing, changing me into His likeness. It's Yeah. 
Never stop Amen. in that changing transformation process. Amen. It was a lifetime for Enoch. Yes. It took him 65 years first before he could recognize the need that he needed to get back in there. And once he got a hold of that, for the next 300 years of his life, he walked with God. Hallelujah. Let us be ready. We are on that track. We're on that process. And we must not stop. We must not relent. We must keep going. You can have all the things around you that are going on. We're not asking you to leave this world right away just because you want to walk with God. Enoch was here in this world and he walked with God. You can be going to school. You can be on your job. You can be doing whatever. But you can still be walking with God. You can be walking with God no matter what you are doing. Practice his presence. The next time that you are in your room trying to do something, whatever it is you are trying to do, no matter how minuscule, how many small it is, ask him what he thinks about that. Practice his presence. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Next time you go to the store, practice his presence. And say, hey Lord, how about this one? <laughs> Practice his presence. Walk with him. He's there with you all the time. When you're in the shower, practice his presence. When you're driving, practice. When you're on your job, practice his presence. And when you are in the church here, practice his presence. Don't be distracted. Praise God. Get rid of the distraction. Next time you get into, some people call it quiet time or whatever. I don't know what they call it. Next time you get in there, spend some time with him. Don't be distracted with anything. You know, don't pray for this and that. <laughs> Just to be more like him. Just to be one with you. There's a song like that. I don't really know how to sing it. Just to be one with you. Just to be one with you. That's my desire. Just to be one with you, Lord. If that's your desire here this morning, wave your hands to him. Just to be one with you, Lord. Just to be one with you, Lord. Just to be one with you. Father, we thank you for this service. We thank you for the offering. Thank you for those that gave. We thank you because you have already given us. The Bible says he has given us. Already all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has blessed us already with all spiritual. We'll be talking about that sometime in this series. What it means. What, why he said he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Why he didn't say he has blessed us with all material blessings. We'll be talking about that. And we'll be talking about how things must happen first in that realm. Before they happen here. You know. So he has already blessed us. In heavenly places with all things. It's for us to enter into his blessings. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise and give you glory. Now, as you go into this week, practice the presence of the Lord. And when you, your flesh wants to detract, distract you, tell the flesh to die in the name of Jesus. Father, we pray for the grace of God to be enabled in us. You know, I believe it's in maybe Second Peter three eighteen or something. He said, look, grow in the grace of God and in the knowledge See, grow in the grace of, that's right, Second Peter 3.18. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. And think about that thing that you just said. We say it all the time without thinking about it. Communion is a place of fellowship. Don't let your communion with him be broken. And surely, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And may we dwell in the presence of the Lord forever and ever. 
Amen. God bless you all. Have a great week ahead. Praise the Lord.